It's a happy time for us, dear Marlena. Oh, just think. This will be the first time the twins are together to celebrate their birthday with all our family. Adora's friends even came from far off Etheria, and they're all helping to decorate. Oh, Perfuma, thank you. They're beautiful. A little higher, Flutterina. I think purple would look good up there, Pika Blue. Try it. What a celebration. The preparations have been going on for days. You know, it reminds me of how we used to get ready for Christmas at this time of year. Christmas? What's that? An Earth holiday? A very special Earth holiday. I wonder where Adam and Man-at-Arms are. Shouldn't we be helping with the decorations? In a minute. We're almost finished here. You know, if it works, this little sky spy will give us a complete picture of Skeletor's every move. Hmm, interesting. Think I'll take a look. But how do I get inside? Aha! All right, Adam, I think we're in good shape for tomorrow's flight. What happened? What did I do? Switch off the rockets. I, I can't. The controls won't work. Something tells me I'm in big trouble. That's a meteor. A meteor? You better have your eyes checked, you lame brain. Yeah, watch it, Motor Mouth. Enough, too bad. Get that ship before it escapes, or I'll put both your heads in orbit. Uh, left it is, sir. To the right. Yes, sir, Skeletor. Left. Right. Oh, no. It's the collector, and it's chasing me. What's happening? The Sky Spy suddenly took off by itself. Look, Skeletor's going after the Sky Spy. Then He-Man's going after Skeletor. By the power of Grayskull! I've got a feeling my brother may need some help. You're trying to grab more than you can handle. Yeah, I've almost got it. You've almost got it. I've almost got it. Oh, no! You know what? 
These claws need a manicure. Holmes, what is it? What's happened? Uh, m -m 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 Master, it's He-Man. Quiet, you'll hear us. There we are, claws to paws. Use the force belts. Don't let him get away with it. Yes, Master. A force belt, huh? Uh-oh, there are too many of these things. Looks like you need a hand, brother. Sis, just in time, as usual. Let's get a little fresh air in here. Ready? One, two... Three! Try a spell? Why not? Sky spy, sky spy, skippity skate, take me down to someplace safe. Oh no! Now what did I do? The sky spy, it's spinning off into space. They're getting away! What are you doing, Rattler? He man ruined our controls. The automatic pilot is taking us back to Snake Mountain. What? Then take this. I don't need a parachute. That's what you think. I'm afraid we've lost your Sky Spy. Well, it's a good thing nobody's in it. I never should have gotten into this thing. And nobody even knows I'm here. I can't understand how the ship just took off by itself. Maybe this finder beam can locate it. Phew, it's slowing down. Why am I glad? Back home again. Hey, that doesn't look like eternity. We're, we're going in. Found you? 
Yeah, I'm the one who's lost. My ship crashed just over that hill. Come on, I'll show you. And maybe we can find a way to get you safely home to your parents. I'll have the finder activated in just a... Duncan, Adam, we've got a serious problem. What is it? It's Orko. He's missing. Missing? Yes, and we just found his magic book outside. Where? Near the launch pad. A launch pad? Uh-oh, he must have stowed away on the Sky Spy. Yes, and accidentally switched on the rockets. We've got to find him. Uh, what's that? It's a flying saucer. Nah, it's just a Sky Spy. Come on, let's go inside and warm up. You said you were looking for a, a Christmas tree? What's that? First of all, it's a Christmas. No, I mean, it's not a Christmas tree. It's a Christmas tree. And it's to celebrate Christmas. Well, what's Christmas? Everybody knows what Christmas is. I don't. When you get lots of presents. Presents? <laughs> I think I like Christmas. Well, presents are part of it. But it's also a time when everybody thinks about peace and goodwill toward men. That's what the angel said. Angel? Now I'm really getting confused. No, it's not confusing. Not at all. Listen, if you really don't know about Christmas, we'll tell you the whole story. A long, long time ago... I've got it. Here's where the Sky Spy landed. Why, those are Earth's coordinates. Orko's landed on Earth. Are you saying that we'll never get Orko back? No, Tila. My transport beam might do it. The problem is it needs a carrium water crystal to power it, and there are none here on Eternia. But maybe on Etheria. It's possible. Well, if it's in the water, her mister would know about it. But can you have She-Ra contact her? I think that can be arranged. And the three wise men followed the star until they finally reached Bethlehem. Ah, oh, what a beautiful story. But what about the gifts? You said there were gifts at Christmas. That's the fun part. Let's tell them about Santa Claus. <laughs> I'll tell them. Are you sure you don't want me to come along, sis? No, Adam. If something happens to me, you'll be needed here. Well, just be sure that nothing happens to you. You're my favorite sister. For the honor of Grayskull! up his reindeer and flies all over the world bringing presents to boys and girls. Presents? I, I think I like this Santa. Can I meet him? Oh, no. He only brings presents when you're asleep. When you're asleep? Well, just as long as he brings them. Uh, tell me about Jingle's Bell. You mean Jingle's Bell. I mean Jingle Bells. <laughs> she And if we don't find one, there's no way to get Orko back. A water crystal. Yes, I know where one is, Shira, but it will not be easy to get. It lies in a deep pool near the old ruins and is guarded by the beast monster. The beast monster is real? I thought it was just a legend. The beast monster is no legend, Shira. It exists and is very dangerous. But if we work together, Good idea. Meet me at the ruins. If you can keep the creature out of the pool long enough, I'll find the water crystal for you. Thanks, my mister. Fly, swift wind.
So this is the pool of the beast monster. Hmm, doesn't look as though anyone's home. Uh-oh, someone's home. <laughs> the beast monster. Oh, keep him busy as long as you can, Shira. I'll do my best. Swifty! Where's Mermista? I found it! Thanks, Mermista. I'm always happy to help. Good luck. I hope this brings Orko back. We could never have found it without Mermista. What's that? I don't know, but it looks as though we found something else, too. What are they? Some kind of sensors, I think. It's a robot. Well, Swifty? Now we have to pass those things to get the crystal back to Man-at-Arms. Watch it, Swifty! My strides, we have. We must go to Monstroid Central and prepare to battle. They're changing into other forms. What evil robots? Very evil and very dangerous. They're called the Monstroids. Our little friends, the Manchines, once told me about them. I'm afraid we haven't seen the last of these evil things. Now, let's get out of here. Sword to flame. Better stand back, Swifty. It's going to get a little warm. Now let's get the crystal back to Man-at-Arms. Even if the crystal works, we'll need help from Orko. I hope he remembers to stand in the light. It's working. Now it's up to Orko. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle bells. What's that? I don't know. I'm afraid. Oh, wait. Man-at-Arms has a transport beam. Now, what did he tell me? Stand in the light. Orko! Don't be scared, Alicia. I think I know what it is. I hope. All we have to do is hold hands and move over there. Where is he? There he is. No, there they are. Who are your friends? This is Alicia and Miguel. We're so glad you're safe. But what happened? It's a long story. And it all started when I got into the Sky Spy. There is a great disturbance. A new spirit of goodness has arrived on Eternia. The power of Hobbit Prime may be threatened. 
Send for Skeletor and Hordak immediately. So that's the story. And here we are. Well, I can't believe it. <laughs> you really crash landed on Earth. Will we be home in time for Christmas? I'm not sure. Duncan? I can't be sure. It may take a few days to recharge the water crystal. But then we'll miss Christmas. I've got an idea. Christmas isn't for several days yet. But the twins' birthday is tomorrow. Why don't we combine their birthday celebration with a big, big Christmas party? That would be fine. But what about Santa? Will he be able to find us? Oh, of course, Alicia. Now, don't worry. Who's Santa? Who's Santa? You don't know who Santa is? I can't believe it. Everybody knows who Santa is. <laughs> the arrival of the spirit of Christmas on Eternia may threaten my rule. I don't need any more goodwill. At Brotherhood on that planet, find it and crush it. Have no fear, Great Master. I will eliminate this, this Christmas spirit before another day is passed. You, you can't even handle that muscle-bound female She-Ra. Just a minute. What about the way He-Man handles you, Bone Brain? Bone Brain? Why, you miserable excuse for a villain. Silence! Stop wasting my time. Whoever eliminates the spirit Christmas from Eternia will be well rewarded. That's me. We'll see about that. Well, Alicia, how do you like it here on Eternia? Everybody here is nice, but I'm his mom and dad. Oh, don't be sad, children. You'll be home soon. And until then, I'll make it seem like springtime. No, Perfume. Christmas is in the winter. Winter? Oh, no sooner said than done. Perfume, that's wonderful. We've got just the right setting for my new Christmas song. Let's try it. Love and caring, peaceful bliss, joy. <laughs> now that's the Christmas spirit. There they are. Get the tractor beam ready. It's Hordak. Run! Help! Help! Hey, put them down. You'll be sorry. Wait till He-Man and She-Ra find out. You won't get away with this. We've got them, Master. Good! Take us back to Etheria, Katra. We couldn't get to Orko and the children. Hordak was too quick with his freeze beam. Were you able to track him? Yes, in the beginning. But Hordak was taking them to Etheria. I don't know where they are now. Well, the first thing we have to do is find them. Right. Let's check with Pika Blue. Maybe her multivision can help find the children. Ah! Oh, the monstroids. We better get out of here. Why did you stop us? These prisoners were being delivered to Horde Prime. The prisoners stay here. You may go. 
You don't think I'd leave them here? I don't care what you think. You have ten seconds to gather your beast companions and depart. What? No bucket of bolts is going to push Hordak around. Six. Nine. Eight. Seven. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I do have some urgent business elsewhere. Just wait till Horde Prime hears about this. Place the creatures in prison. When Horde Prime comes for them, we will deal with him. As you command, number one. We know the children are in the Fright Zone, but we don't know where. I'll try to help. I see them. They've been captured by the Monstroids. I knew we'd have trouble with them again. Yes, but the little robot people have gone to rescue the children. Robot people? You mean the machines? Exactly. And they'll need help. The Monstroids are very powerful. Don't worry, Pika Blue. We'll cut them down to size. Let's go, sis. This is a pretty mess, and it's all my fault. No, it isn't, Orko. You were trying to help us. Well, I didn't do a very good job. Hello. Who are you? My name's Cutter. What's yours? Well, I'm Orko, and this is Alicia and Miguel. But, but, but how did you know we were here? We're the Manchines. The Monstroids are our enemies. Come on, let's get you out of there. But how? The windows got bars. They don't call me Cutter for nothing. Watch. <laughs> Climb out, quickly. My cousin's waiting. Who? My cousin. Here he comes now. Boy, he's fast. They don't call him Zipper for nothing. Zipper! There's a menstruate just around the corner. giving orders, Metal Mouth. Now let's see how good you are at taking them. Move away from my friends. It's E-Man. Seize him. Keep your claws to yourself. <clears throat> Sorry to get you all tied up. The human creature is alone. I think you need a lesson in adding, Iron Head. Sword to lasso! Clumsy, clumsy, clumsy! <laughs> what works for my sister works for me. The odds look a bit uneven. Oh, no, they don't, He-Man. It's Cutter and the Manchines. Come on, Cutter. We'll send the Monstroids back to the junkyard. Right where they belong. Let's get to work. He -Man.
reward me richly if I deliver those two Earth children. What? Ha! Got you at last, you troublesome tots. Let him go. Well, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Thanks for your help. We... He-Man! She-Ra! Look! Skeletor's taking the kids! We'll see about that. Swift wind! Oh, no, you don't, She-Ra! from delivering them to Horde Prime. Don't be so sure, Bonehead. Well, it's Horder. Grant him, he wants to reward himself. Well, I'll soon take care of him. Ah, that skull-faced scoundrel has damaged my ship. Now I'll have to turn back. But first, I'll make sure that he doesn't go anywhere. We're going down. I'll get you for that, Hordak. We'll have to crash land in that snow. Swift Wind, are you all right? Yes, but where are the children? Skeletor got away with them. But don't worry. Now that you're free, we'll get them back. Let's go, brother! Drat that Hordak! He'll be back with reinforcements! Well, we won't be here! Get moving, you two! We have a long walk ahead of us! I... I... I, I don't think we can... move! It, it's awfully... cold! I said move! Move it! Please, mister. Be nice. It, it's Christmas time. Christmas time? What's that? It's a, it's a season of love and joy and caring. Ah, is that what Christmas is? No wonder Hard Prime wants to get rid of it. A season of love, caring, Joy? Yeah, what a disgusting idea. Well, there's no Christmas spirit here. Now get moving, you two, before Hordak comes back. I... I'm sorry, mister, but, but we're so cold. So you're cold. Oh, blast it. <laughs> Mr. Skeletor, you are very kind. Kind? Never use that word around me. Now get moving. Oh, wait. I have to get Relay. No. Leave him. But he'll freeze. We have to. I said leave him. Now move. me. But whatever it is, I don't like it. Oh, stop licking my face, you dratty dog. Get away from me. You're drowning me. Get off. It was nice of you to say relay, Mr. Skeletor. I am not nice. Oh, stop that. Do you want me to hold him? Eh, uh, no. Uh, no. No, we'll go faster if uh, if I carry him. But uh, tell me more about this uh, this Christmas. Well, 
It's a wonderful time of the year. Everyone has lots of fun. You mean they get in fights? No, no, they have fun. Fights are fun. I like fights. And you give each other presents. And when you open them, they explode, right? No, they're nice gifts. Nice? Doesn't sound like much fun to me. Ah! A snow beast. Quick, get behind me. <laughs> so much for the snow beast. Listen, I am not nice, I am not kind, and I am not wonderful. And I'm still delivering you to Horde Prime. There they are. Please, Mr. Skeletor, we don't want to be taken by Horde Prime. Please don't. Let him go, Boneface. And he man Drat. We'll take those children. No, I'll take those children. Hornet, double drat. That's right, Skeletor. I figured you'd show up here. When you two are finished, we'll take the children. Now hand them over. Horde Prime will know who's number one. They're mine, Hordak. <laughs> Good aim! You hit yourself! <laughs> now I'll take those goody goods. Not if we can help it, Hordak. Better get back, children. Orko, go with them. Right! You're not delivering them to Horde Prime. Forget it, He-Man. The little fools are delivering themselves to Horde Prime. It's Horde Prime. Come on, Shiro, we must stop him. Robots, get them! <laughs> Hang on, Arco! We're on our way! Enough for me. Oh. Here, catch, brother. Thanks, sis. Good work, brother. Now let's get the children. Uh oh. Too late, Shira. Horde Prime's got them. Know what's happening to me, but I must save the children. Blast! That skeleton's hit my engines. Horde Prime ship is down. Let's go, Shira. <laughs> I think Horde Prime is going to be angry with me. You have made me angry, Skeletor. Very angry, indeed. Quickly, He-Man. Let's send this troublemaker back home. Right you are, Shira. Ready? he, -he! There, that'll take care of Hort Prime for a while. Skeletor, Skeletor, thank you, Skeletor. Skeletor, thanks so much. He saved us. He saved you? Yes, 
I, I, I guess I did. Oh, I wish I knew why. Oh, oh, I, I don't think I feel well. Well, I think you're feeling the Christmas spirit, Skeletor. It makes you feel good. Well, I don't like to feel good. I like to feel evil. Oh. Don't worry, Skeletor. Christmas only comes once a year. Ah, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas. Here, a flying belt for each of you. Oh, thank you, Santa. <laughs> it's too bad you can't stay for the party, but I'm sure your parents miss you very much. We miss them, too, but Man at Arms says we'll be home soon. That's right, Miguel. You'll be home just in time to hang up your stocking. Ready to go? Wait. Relay, go to Adora. Will you make sure Relay gets back to the machines, Adora? Of course, Alicia. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone, and, and thank you. you. Oh, thank heavens you're back. We were so worried. Oh, Mother, Father, it was great. We went to another planet, and... Oh, Miguel, <laughs> don't make up stories. Tomorrow you can tell us where you really were. We're just glad to have you home safe. But we did go to another planet, Mom. Honest. And we met Orko, and Santa Claus gave us these flying belts. Now, 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 Alicia, I don't know where you got those, those things, whatever they are, but it is bedtime. Okay, Father. And Merry Christmas! Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas, young lady! Merry Christmas... ...brother. Ho, you know... You knew it was me all the time, didn't you? Uh-huh. Well, Merry Christmas, sis. Merry Christmas, everybody! So that's how Christmas first came to Eternia. Not everyone celebrates Christmas, but the spirit of the Christmas season is within us all. It's a season of love and joy and caring. And presents. <laughs> presents are nice, Orko, but Christmas means much more than that. I know, Adam. Christmas is a time of peace and caring and happiness. That's right, Orko. And what would make you happiest this Christmas? Presents. Oh, Orko. <laughs> <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode commentary. However, this time it's not simply an episode of He-Man, this time it's the He-Man and She-Ra Christmas Special, which, as I only found out last year, was referred to in-house at Filmation as How Christmas Came to Eternia. Doesn't that sound rather delightful? Now it's mentioned in this opening scene that it's Adam and Adora's first birthday together, which puts this within the same year as the first time She-Ra was introduced into the mythos. Brown man helping out Madame Raz and Broom there? Crazy visual. Now you want to feel really old. In the season 2 He-Man episode The Great Books Mystery, Prince Adam was shown turning 19 years old, which technically means in this episode He-Man and She-Ra, Prince Adam and Princess Adora, are turning 20 years old. 20 years old! That makes me feel ancient. I am ancient. Now keen-eared viewers will notice that... Keen-eared? Is that even a phrase? Keen-eared viewers will notice that the only characters name checked in this opening are Perfuma, Flutterina and Peekaboo. And guess what? They had toys coming out around the same time. Filmation, how could you? And also, all three are prominently featured in the story of this special. And here, of course, we have Queen Marlena telling King Randall all about Christmas, which I fail to believe that in all their years of wedded bliss, they've never spoken about. I always love these panning shots in the Christmas special where we get to see the Eternian and Aetherian characters helping one another out. I mean, Castaspella and Stratos. Who'd have thunk it? And here we have Man at Arms working on his latest invention, which of course will play its part in the script soon. 
relatively soon, very soon in fact, in fact within the next 30 seconds. I like the idea of uh, the heroes just constantly spying on Skeletor. It's like, give the villain some privacy for goodness sake. Hmm, interesting. Think I'll take a look. And now we have the mischievous Orko, which is my least favourite of the Orko characters. You're probably thinking, what's he talking about? But Orko was written in a variety of ways by a variety of different writers. I always felt when they wrote Orko as a child, it was the least appealing version of the character. And the case in point, there he goes. He has to go in and then he plays rocket ship. Stop that, Orko. You're more mature than that. Now, something bad's about to happen and you can tell that because the music has become slightly dramatic. But what can go wrong? Man Arms and Prince Adam are monitoring the situation. But apparently Man Arms built a ship that if you break the control lever, it takes off. Good work, Man Arms. They can sound looks. What did you do, Duncan? Also, this is what I call Season 2 Adam, because he's illustrated in a certain way here. That's a Season 2 illustration. Orko cross-eyed. Because it's funny he just committed a bad act. Now, while these opening credits run, I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk about my experience with the Christmas special. Now, as a kid, I remember going down to our local news agent and picking up a copy of the TV Times, which was a TV listings magazine. I remember flipping through the pages and seeing that uh, there was going to be a He-Man and She-Ra Christmas special, and I was so excited, like you wouldn't believe. I remember watching it that, that year and just absolutely loving it. Loved it as a kid. Absolutely loved this special as a kid. Always watched it on Christmas. However, these days I have a few issues with it, which I will reveal probably through tears as this special continues. So you're in for quite the treat. Now this special is actually written by Don Heckman and Bob Ford and directed by Ernie Schmidt and Bill Reed. I think they used two writers and two directors because basically this is two episodes in total. It's like a 40 minute special. There's too bad in implying that um, straight from the get go we're getting all the latter season characters. Skeletor shaking his fists as always. A truly great piece of animation. It's interesting to see the Collector which was a evil warrior ship which was primarily used in season one but rarely used in season two however it did make an appearance in the she-ra episode battle for bright moon i always like this shot of adora in man arms lab because it's such an interesting visual to see this ethereal character prominent ethereal character in an eternian setting because it was so rarely ever seen in the she-ra series except for the first few episodes and prince adam commands the power of castle grayskull and apparently he has the power See, I told you so. Now, this is interesting. He-Man's going to take to the skies, not in the Wind Raider or the Sky Sled, but in the Laser Bolt. Now, anybody that knows the Masters of the Universe toy line knows that the Laser Bolt cannot fly. It is unable to fly. It's a ground vehicle. However, I think this is Filmation just giving a nod to Mattel, saying, yes, we'll advertise one of your toys for once. So here we have He-Man in the Laser Bolt, taken to the skies. Now, check out this assortment of villains. We've got Webstore, Ratlaw, Spycor, and Too Bad. Now Rattler's an interesting one because primarily he was a Master of the Universe action figure. However, he made his appearances in the She-Ra series as a member of the Horde. So why he's showing up as one of Skeletor's evil warriors beats me. Also, it's nice to see the Collector's Claws used for the first time in the series here. Usually the Collector's Claws were just a, you know, a part of the vehicle's design, but here we see they can actually move and bend. Someone's going to correct me now and say, oh, did you know an episode? And I'll be like, oh, I should have remembered they moved in that episode. So we've got He-Man turning the claws to paws, as he says, because He-Man loves a good bit of wordplay. Use the force belt. Don't let him get away with it. Yes, don't let him get away with it. So yeah, let's use the force belt. Now, this is interesting because obviously He-Man is like overpowered. It's a really good, you know, device here. This really does overpower He-Man. You can believe that the most powerful man in the universe is overpowered by all these cords and I love the animation as he's trying to reach for the sword but here's a little secret do you know why he's captured because it makes She-Ra's appearance all the more dramatic and gives her a reason to suddenly fly in the shot on Swiftwind so here comes She-Ra the princess of power throws a sword he mans free let's get a little fresh air in here I love the way that these two work together. They were, they were always written as two really good characters in battle, like the way they would talk to one another. Just smashing Skeletor's property. Now this is where the story gets really silly. At this point, Orko decides to sensibly use his magic on the Sky Spy. I honestly don't know what Man at Arms ship does, because Orko can activate it by ripping the lever out of its socket. Orko's magic can send it 
well as you're about to see into warp drive function or something look it, it suddenly goes incredibly fast now man arm said this this ship was just supposed to spy on the baddies but by all accounts it, it, it traverses the space-time continuum or something i have no idea Ratlaw speaking part Ratlaw voiced by Lou Scheimer. Spycore voiced by Lou Scheimer as well. I always love this scene. Not only because I love this assortment of villains, but just the gag with like, I don't need a parachute. <laughs> yes, you do. Also, I, this is a great shot of the villains. Or, you know, this would be a great piece of animation art time with the characters holding on for dear life onto one another. What I love about those villains, such a colourful collection of evil. Here we go, here's an interesting thing. He Man and She Ra effortlessly can breathe in space. Now you could argue, well, maybe they're, they're on the cusp and th there's still oxygen up there. From what I'm looking at, there's no oxygen. This is something that was, you know, a bit hit and miss in the series. If you go and look at an episode like Hall Prime Takes a Holiday, He Man and She Ra cannot breathe in space. If you go and look at the season two She Ra episode, or Saw on the Hive, they have absolutely no problem breathing in space. In fact, He Man has a fight in space with some meteorbs. That's another story for another time. And here's a little throwaway scene with Prince Adam and Man Arms trying to figure out what the heck just happened. Man Arms has got a finder beam, apparently. Now, back in 2012, Gary Goldstein, a storyboard artist at Formation, kindly gave me the storyboard for a Christmas special. He had actually storyboarded the first act. And in this shot, you see the planet Earth. And the storyboard by Gary Goldstein actually states, not obviously Earth. Because obviously you don't want to spoil it for the kids watching or the audience in the... Oh, Orko's heading towards Earth, so it's a surprise when suddenly... Hang on a second. This all looks very, very familiar. And one thing I want to point out about the Earth backgrounds is they don't actually have the black line art that all Eternian backgrounds generally have. Now, there's an interesting visual coming up that for years, I believe, was Filmation's homage to Columbia's Ghostbusters logo. Because if you look at Orko when he's covered in snow, he's got two little dots for eyes and a dot for a mouth. However, that could be argued, of course, that... that is paying homage to the Filmation Ghostbusters logo, which would come out a year later. Who knows? Although I looked at the storyboards and it makes no mention of it. It actually says, make Orko look like a crazy snowman. It doesn't use the word crazy. I just inserted that. I will admit that as a kid, I absolutely love the idea that Orko was on Earth. It just brought the show closer, if that makes any sense. It was like, wow, Orko is on Earth. Goodness knows what part of Earth, but he's on Earth somewhere. This doesn't look like anywhere I grew up, put it that way. But think, if Orca hadn't been here, these children would have been buried by an avalanche. That would have been a very different Christmas special. I always love the kids' non-reaction to Orca. It's like, could you could you please put us down? Surely they'd be like, ah, and just screaming and cry. What's that? There's an alien. He's floating. He's got blue skin. Oh, my God. That said, Orca is pretty awesome. So maybe we'd all react and say, hey, little dude, let's shake your hand. There's a great piece of dialogue coming up between Orko and Alicia in which Orko kind of makes her feel better by saying she's not the one that's lost, he's the one that's lost. Found you? Yeah, I'm the one who's lost. My... For some reason, that's one of my favourite exchanges of dialogue in this entire Christmas special. I just think it works so well. And coming up is one of my favourite shots from the Christmas special already. Look at that. You've got Teela... Queen Marlena and Princess Adora, that is like three incredibly strong female characters. And they rarely ever shared screen time together. So to see all three in the same shot is just like, yes, that is pretty awesome. And oh, just about stopped myself from saying girl power there. There's a great little exchange between Alicia and Orko here. Alicia's like, it's a flying saucer. And Orko's like, nah, it's just a sky spy. Yes, Orko. A sky spy that you do not own and yet you felt compelled to get aboard and mess around with. And here's where the Christmas special excels, I think, in that they use the story to explain the spirit of Christmas to Orko as opposed to the story of Christmas. And there's one of my favourite lines coming up here. When you get lots of presents. Presents? <laughs> I think I like Christmas. I love Orko's reaction upon hearing that presents are given at Christmas. I think I like Christmas. Now, Orko's about to hear the story of Christmas, but we as an audience are going to go back to Eternia and find out how everybody's doing. And the first thing we're going to see is the characters in front of a giant monitor screen. Now, the numbers that appear on the monitor actually relate to Filmation's place of business during the time of this production. As an example, you'll see 
18107. That's actually the street address. There's a phone number and the telex address as well. So it's very much the artists at Filmation having a little in-joke there that nobody else would pick up on. Now listen to this quickly. The problem is it needs a carrium water crystal. To... Man Arms says a carrium water crystal. Now for years it didn't dawn on me at all. I'm like, oh, a carrium water crystal. Go and watch Brave Star. And the equivalent of gold in that show is carrium. So carrium first shows up in He-Man and She-Ra, a Christmas special. I'd love to think it was somewhat the same kind of crystal and therefore it ties Brave Star and He-Man together. Actually, in the first draft of the Brave Star series Bible, He-Man was referenced as an influence to Brave Star, but sadly they removed that. So yeah, here we are back on Earth and... Oh no, we're back on Eternia. It jumps around this story quite a bit. Uh, the kids were about to tell Orko all about Santa Claus, or as I like to call him, Santor, because that just sounds like such a great name and such a great character. An Eternian version of Santa Claus. For the honor of Greystar. And of course here, Princess Adora is transforming into She-Ra. And for those that know me, I've never been a fan of the She-Ra transformation, only because I find this shot, where she stood at Castle Greystar on the Crystal Castle, to be kind of protracted. It's quite long. I am in the actual development of the She-Ra transformation, there was a much faster, more powerful looking transformation sequence that will be featured in a future video on this channel. Also, it's really cool to see uh, Adora transform into She-Ra within the grounds of the Royal Palace. Like, all, this, all these Eternian backgrounds that we've seen numerous times before. Now She-Ra's here, hopping on a winged horse. Sorry, unicorn. <gasps> And here we are back on Earth with Orko continuing to learn all about Christmas, now learning about Santa Claus. Or as I like to call him, Santor. I'm going to stop talking about Santor, I promise. This is, that's the last one. Last reference to Santor on this commentary. A oh, little trivia piece here. In the storyboards and early character designs, Alicia was a brunette and not a blonde. There's a lot of blonde in this episode. You've got Prince Adam, Adora, Alicia. That's three. Wow, I've, I've really uh, I've set an example there. And here we are in the Crystal Falls, which would later show up in the season two Shira episode. Sorry, the classic season two Shira episode, Sweet Bee's Home. It will be the place where Froster begins flirting with He-Man. And here we have Mamista, voiced by Melody Brett. And one thing we should mention about Mamista is she has a French accent. Ah, and listen to this piece of dialogue. Ready? The beast monster is real. I thought it was just a legend. Yes. Now, if you go back and listen to the commentary I did for the Shaping Staff. You will hear me talk about how certain characters in certain situations would say something was a legend to give it more impact. And in this case, the legend is the Beast Monster, the creature with the worst name ever given to any character in the series. Because Beast Monster are two terms for a monster, a creature. It's not like King Liz from the Rock People, which is quite possibly the greatest name for a monster ever. King Liz. Genius. Now one of my favourite things about the Christmas special is the fact that we get to see a few new locations on Etheria, because one of my criticisms of the She-Ra series is that it very rarely deviated away from the Whispering Woods and the Fright Zone. Every once in a while an episode would go to another part of Etheria, but it was very rare, very, very rare. The series was heavily reliant upon the Whispering Woods and the Fright Zone as story points, as it were. And looking at this location, it's very obvious that the Horde once dominated this place or something, given that it has that polluted sky, the brown and gold colour, which was actually established in the He-Man episode Quest for He-Man, if you go back. Uh -oh. Someone's home. Now, the Beast Monster. Um, I've always been a bit indifferent to this creature, like, like I said earlier, a ridiculous name. But I find the design of the character ridiculous as well. A character, sorry, he's not a character, he's a, he's a monster. He's the Beast Monster, apparently. And um, I just find his proportions and his expression, he's got these like big goofy eyes and silly long neck and even the way he walks, like grrr, it just looks ridiculous and he can't catch anything and he falls over, it's just, it's just a rubbish monster basically, they should have called him rubbish monster, not beast monster, trash monster. So the inept beast monster, actually that's the end of the beast monster's appearance in this special, he basically fell over and that was it, God, he really is a rubbish monster. Oh, and this piece of dialogue here from a mister. I found it. That's my go-to line. Whenever I whenever I think of a mister, I always think of I found it in her little French accent. So yeah, my mister dives into the pond. We presume goes all the way back to the Crystal Falls. So obviously this uh, river or sea or lake or whatever is connected in some way. Now watch what Shira does with the crystal. She kind of places it near her waist and it just vanishes. As a kid, due to poor TV broadcast quality, I honestly thought she popped it down the front of her top. Very strange. 
and now we have the very very odd debut of the monstroid or monstroids i should say as there are many of them now the monstroid was a toy released in the masters universe toy line it was a horde robot creature that could grab action figures in its claws and spin around like crazy however for some reason here the monstroid becomes the monstroids although i like to call them reject transformers for uh, reasons that will become obvious very soon fade to black Now, I always think visually the Monstroids are very cool looking, uh, especially for a Filmation series which was always quite simplistic in its detail with regards to character. The Monstroids are very complicated and very detailed. There's a lot going on in them. And uh, they move fairly well as well. As I say that the character just stomps on the screen where he's clearly been Xeroxed across. <laughs> now Swiftwind here says one of the most quoted lines from the special ever. I'll let him talk. <laughs> changing into other forms. What evil robots? <laughs> the, uh, the general consensus of that uh, infamous line by Swiftwind is that this was Formation's dig at the Transformers, although I don't think Transformers had much to worry about given these laughable transformations. Check this, arms out, arms by the side. This next transformation is actually pretty good, the tank. This is good. That's okay, the last transformation is pointless. Arms out, legs back, that's it. That's The character is basically laying down. When he lays down, he is transformed. It makes no sense. So yeah, I think with regards to Filmation, Transformers had nothing to worry about really. I also thought this was a very cool sword transformation. We saw Sword to Rope. Here we see She-Ra Sword to Flame, which um, cuts through anything. And here we see She-Ra performing the famous jump spinning crescent kick, although for years I used to refer to it as a jump spinning round ass kick. In my youth I could actually do that kick, I don't think I can anymore. Bad back, bad feet, bad knees, you know it is. And here we are back on Eternia in Man at Arms Lab with Prince Adam, Princess Adora and Man at Arms. Man at Arms with the Kerium water crystal. Now, this next scene opens up with the kids singing Jingle Bells. But listen to the lyrics very carefully. It's up to Orko. Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. What version of Jingle Bells has Jingle Bells sang three times in a row? None that I know of. Also, this is, this is one of those moments in the script that I think is slightly far-fetched, apart from an alien being on the planet Earth, is that Orko sees a light and suddenly remembers the time Man at Arms told him to stand in the light. That just sounds a little bit like, what? Seriously? Maybe it's something else, Orko. And the characters disappear along with the Sky Spy and the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree I've just realised this second is the same Christmas tree that appears at the end of the episode. I love Adam's reaction here. There he is. No, there they are. That's really wonderfully illustrated. Like his eyes are wide eyed and he's got that big smile on his face. Oh, if this was season one of He-Man, that would be Teela he was kissing. Orko, you, you bad boy, you. So at this point, Orko proceeds to tell them all about his little adventure, at which point man arms should just grab him and say, what did you do to the Sky Spy, you miserable trollin? So here we are on Horde World, the rarely seen exterior shot of Horde World, where Horde Prime dwells. I should point out that I actually own the background for this. It's a long panning shot. It's not me bragging, by the way. At some point, I'd like to feature it on the channel. Um, it's interesting to see this background without all the smoke and the effects over it, because you can see the kind of statue from which Horde Prime, we presume, speaks, because we never actually see him. And here we are in the throne room of the Royal Palace. We've got King Randor, Queen Marlena, Man at Arms, Teela, Adam, Adora, and Orko. It's an uh, incredibly large cast in one scene. What I actually like about this scene more than anything is that Queen Marlena is given some decent dialogue because, as she's from Earth, she knows how important Christmas is to these kids, whereas the others really don't have an idea of it. Maybe Orko does now since he's been given the entire story and he knows all about Santor, sorry, Santa Claus. But what I like about this is that how um, Alicia in, in inadvertently kind of tags Christmas onto Adam and Adora's birthdays. I'd like Adam to turn around and go, hang on a second, this is our special day, not this Christmas celebration nonsense. Who's Santa? Who's Santa, Adam asks, and by the end of this special, he will actually be dressed up as Santa Claus. So it's a very unique adventure for the Prince of Eternia. We're back on Horde World, and this is by far the biggest problem I have with the Christmas special, in that we see Hordak and Skeletor summoned by Horde Prime. Now, the problem I have with this is that Skeletor, as was shown in the She-Ra episode Reunions, defected from the Horde a long, long time ago. 
So why is he summoned by Horde Prime to do Horde Prime's bidding? I understand that there's some sort of like rivalry between Hordak and Skeletor, of course. It's a it's a ridiculously large rivalry. But the idea of having them vying for Horde Prime's affections, as it were, just seems ludicrous. There's no point to that. And Skeletor is at his best when he's independent. And oddly, in the second season of She-Ra, Skeletor reappears and again he's not associated with Horde in any way so I don't know why for this special he had to be associated with Horde Prime it just seems very strange I absolutely love this shot of Skeletor and Hordak doing the face off and then turning to the camera that's me we'll see about that oh I promised I'd never do a Skeletor impression again I apologize I've just weirdly had a flashback to the 80s um, when this was broadcast in the UK the act break actually occurred after the previous scene with Horde Prime and Skeletor and Hordak so this would now be the second act in the UK and until then I'll make it seem like springtime now I just said I had an issue with the previous scene because Skeletor was working for Horde Prime this is the scene I take great issue with because this song is just just bizarre and it's the, the funny thing is I, I like the idea of Bo just chilling on Eternia that's okay and Perfumer's I think an awesome character all round so that's, that's is a, this is a really nice visual but it's the fact they all break into song which Bo calls his new song so let's all start singing no I'm not going to start singing to this song I'm just going to try and figure out the fundamentals behind it now the only explanation I can offer is that this is like a jam session you know, like back in the day with Paul McCartney sitting in a recording studio somewhere and in walks Jimi Hendrix and they just start making music together. But it's not recorded. It's just them jamming away. So I'm thinking that this is one of those jam sessions. Just Bo picks up his heart, starts playing. They all start coming up with lyrics and that's how it happens. This is the only way I can tolerate this scene. I cannot tolerate Orko and Cal dancing. I refuse to. I'm going to look away. <laughs> Is it over? It's over, thank goodness. Um, so that's the Christmas spirit. And here comes Hordak's uniquely shaped helicopter. I just called it helicopter. <laughs> oh, this Christmas special is clearly sending me mad. And now we see um, Bo's usefulness, non-existent. But bear in mind, Perfumer stood there where she was. What's Perfumer doing? It's like, Perfumer, do something. Oh no, wait a second. Your power is useless. You know, Perfumer caused Hordak all kinds of headaches in the classic She-Ra season one episode, Flowers for Hordak. You think, Perfumer, just make flowers appear everywhere, all, in, all around his ship. But Perfumer does nothing. Actually, I think that's the last we see of Perfumer in the episode. One of the interesting things about that previous scene, and another problem I have with the Christmas special, God, I've got so many problems with this special, is that in the She-Ra series, season one and season two, the idea of the Horde traveling to Eternia was like a big deal. There were episodes such as He Ain't Heavy, Gateway to Trouble and Dark Smoke and Fire in which one of the main plots was the Horde traversing dimensions or planets I should say in order to invade Eternia. However in this special it just seems that the Horde can jump around willy nilly like one minute they're on Eternia now they're back on Etheria flying over another new Etherian location which I presume is Monstroid Central, since the Monstroids mentioned they were going to take the prisoners back there. So yeah, we're on Monstroid Central. So yeah, the idea that the, the plot jumps around, as do the characters, just doesn't quite work for me. Also, the thing I don't like about this scene is the way, you know, Hordak and the Horde are a pretty awesome force to be reckoned with, but here the Monstroids just make them look like fools. And don't get me wrong, the Monstroids are a really, really big threat. The funny thing about this is, in the season 2 She-Ra episode, Day of the Flowers, the Monstroids come off looking like fools and Hordak bosses them around. It's a very, very strange contrast when you compare it to this episode. Basically, the Monstroids return and Hordak has them at his command and Hordak's insulting them and the Monstroids come across as fools who can't even climb up one single mountain. There's a great bit of comic animation coming up here. You kind of saw it hinted at there with Modulot, Multibot and Catra. But here we get Hordak doing the Scooby-Doo run, as it were, and it's just time to perfection he kind of zips out a shot after doing the uh, running on spot the other thing i just have to quickly ask is why did the horde not just take them straight to horde world why did he take them back to ethereum if he's got to deliver them to horde prime why wasn't the meeting place on horde world it just makes perfect sense and of course he man and she-ra on eternity have to find out where the children have been taken so rather than speak to the sorceress of Castle Grayskull, who pretty much can tell you anything. They travel back to Etheria to speak to Peekaboo. Well, actually, we presume they've gone back to Etheria because Peekaboo was on Eternia, but Peekaboo lives on Etheria and she's clearly in some sort of palace or castle of her own here. 
Let's just assume this is Etheria. This is very confusing. So now we hear about the little robot people called the Manchines. Now, the Manchines, that's, that sounds interesting because it's like a deviation of the word machine, but it's got man in it. So Manchines, they sound like a, they sound scary. They sound powerful, man. This is a pretty mess and it's all my fault. And in fact, we're going to meet the Manchines very shortly. Short being the operative word. You do a very good job. Hello. Yes, here we go. My name's Cutter. What's yours? This is Cutter of the Manchines, uh, voiced by George Dicenzo, who voiced Hordak and Bo, although you wouldn't know it with this character. Um, Cutter's come to save them. And do you know why he's called Cutter? Because he's got saw blades for hands. He's got claws that transform into saw blades. So Cutter's pretty awesome in that sense. Look at that. This next shot kind of creeps me out because uh, Alicia looks terrified and everybody looks wrong. Look, look at this shot. Look at Alicia, ah! and you see Cutter in all his glory, and he looks just weird. And not only do we meet Cutter, but we meet his his cousin, as he calls him, who is called Zipper, who is equally as annoying. I mean, equally as interesting to to look at. Here's Zipper. There's a man just around the corner. He speaks like he's got um. He speaks like Buzzoff actually, although Buzzoff's not annoying and Buzzoff is cool. So anyway, Zipper, because he's fast, you know, basically the, the, the clue is in their names. Cutter can cut, Zipper can zip. Also, this scene proves that whilst Cutter is pretty useful, Zipper is absolutely useless because Zipper, as fast as he is, just drives straight into trouble, as we can see here. Yep, good work, Zipper. You useless. There's an opening piece of dialogue here in the next scene that I always used to think said something else. Ready? I actually thought number one, as this robot is called, actually said, um, and the Manchines, whip them. I thought, wow, they're going to whip the Manchines. That seems awfully harsh for a kid's cartoon. He just said, with them. And here's another useful um, monstroid. This this guy actually makes the Manchines look cool. I never thought I'd say that. He's just a long box with claws. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, as I watched this, I just realizing the ridiculous. And He Man just ties up his claws and he ceases to function. Teach him a lesson. So He Man and, and She are going to start taking on the monstroids. I mean, look at these odds for He Man. He Man could, he just tied up one's arms. He could just run through these guys. He Man lifted Castle Greyskull, for goodness sake. He can do anything. So here comes She with the save once again. There's a really, I've always liked this bit of animation of He Man coming up. He does like a little forward roll. Ready? Watch this. Whee! And then lifts up. Oh, this was the. This is of course the robot that has the great transformation, sleepy down transformation. So He Man throws him, crash. There's another one done. He falls to bits that one. Although he does show up in Day of the Flowers, so these monstroids obviously have the capability of uh, repairing themselves. Oh, Cutter said they're going to get their cousins. So I don't know how big their the the Manchin family is, but um, there's a lot of cousins of cousins of cousins in this uh, in this crew, as it were. And now one of the most visually upsetting scenes of this special, I um, I kind of find it hard to watch because it's so bad. <laughs> Look at this. There's loads of them. Why? Come on, Cutter. We'll send the monstroids back to the junkyard. <sighs> Sadly, I have a piece of animation artwork from this scene which names pretty much every single man So coming up, I'll name them. Here comes Piston. Yes. Crank on the left, Rotor on the right. Sadly, none of the others can be named because they don't actually do anything in this scene, but I'll name them for you. There's Clutch, Whipsaw, Digger, Crank, Driller, and Wrench. So you can tell the naming of these characters was first and foremost uh, in the design and the script itself. He's so cute! And the Manchine Puppy, this is technically the beginning of the end for me. Oh, Skeletor's modified war sled there with the extendable seat. I wonder why he's going to need that. Oh, because he captures the kids with relative ease. Oh, Orko. And coming up, I think, is one of the most offensive lines of the Christmas special. Cutter's dialogue. Ready? Well, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Thanks for your help. Cutter has the nerve to say to the most powerful man in the universe and the most powerful woman in the universe, thanks for your help. I hate that line. I think you'll find, Manchines, that you were the one that needed help. He and she effortlessly trashed the robots. You know, Cutter didn't even do anything. And what did Zipper do? Run, you know, oh. So in this next scene, we see that um, Hordak and his crew, rather than flee for their lives, 
actually just hovered nearby in their uniquely shaped helicopter and uh, obviously waiting for a situation like this in which Skeletor would capture the kids so they could capture them back. So it like fires them. Imagine if he just shot the kids, he'd be like, oh, oh, that's kind of gone wrong. Oh, the Manchine puppy's there, of course. I forgot about that thing. I mean, a uh, cute little creature. There's one shot here where we see Skeletor's furry pants and uh, that's a no-no because... If you if you ever watch the filmation series, which I presume watching this video you have watched the filmation series, Skeletor has very smooth pants. Why am I talking about Skeletor's underpants? So anyway, Zap, he blows them. There you go, Skeletor's furry pants. Ready? Furry pants. Incorrect. If you look back there, relay the Manchine puppies just looking up at Skeletor like, what's going on? And yet we're heading towards another um, unique location on Etheria we've never seen before. We've seen snowy regions of Etheria, but this time we see a, uh, a new location because it's got the polluted Horde sky. So here we are in that um, unique location never before seen in the series. You know, polluted sky, snowy mountains. And obviously what this leads to is uh, some of the best things in the Christmas special in which Skeletor interacts with the kids causing his character to change in a variety of ways because at this point in the series Skeletor was at the time one of the most popular characters in the show in both He-Man and She-Ra because obviously Skeletor made appearances in She-Ra without He-Man um, I honestly think that's why he becomes the focal point of this of the scenes that follow it's like if someone's going to learn the spirit of Christmas it's going to be Skeletor because as villainous and as evil as he is Everybody loves him so much. He's one of those villains that everybody just loves. It's just it's just a strange thing with Skeletor. You know, it's a guy with a you know muscle bound physique and a skull for a face or a skull, I should say. But uh, yeah, people just love Skeletor. So I think it was a natural progression for the writers. I'm thinking it was Bob Ford that wrote a lot of the Skeletor dialogue to say, Do you know what? Let's let's make Skeletor feel the spirit of Christmas. It offends me on so many levels, but uh, it's. Uh, it's it's fun. You can't deny that. So you're cold. Look at this, Skeletor. Don't don't be fooled, Skeletor. Don't do it. Don't don't do it, Skeletor. Oh, Skeletor. Okay, Skeletor's given him a couple of warm coats. That's good because he needs his prisoners to survive for Horde Prime, right? So that's that's got to be his reasoning for that. You are very kind. Kind? Never use that word around me. So this is where we get some of the best dialogue from Skeletor dare I say ever it's just it's just brilliant Bob Ford often wrote great skeletal dialogue and although we don't know for a fact that he wrote these particular scenes as this was a shared script I I, I hazard to guess that skeletal the skeletal that Bob Ford did write a lot of this skeletal leave relay the dog behind leave him behind the anime has clearly had fun with the relay because he's given very cartoony expressions keep walking skeletal yeah you better keep moving don't stop Skeletor. Oh, Skeletor stopped. Please. Don't listen to her. Keep walking. Oh, but how can you resist this shot? Even I will admit that's utterly cute. It breaks my heart to say that. So Skeletor, yes, he picks up Relay the Manchine Dog, which is something... Go back to season one of He-Man. Watch the Cosmic Comet. Watch the Shaping Staff. Watch Diamond Ray of Disappearance. Skeletor would not have picked up the Manchine puppy and have it lick his face. <laughs> Although I'm laughing because it's actually quite a funny scene. And that's the genius of this part of the episode, uh, the special, I should say, in that the writers just have so much fun with Skeletor. But it's it's believable because Skeletor is this villain who's deadly serious. But at the same time, you know you can do this kind of stuff with him you know we're laughing at him oh, stop that. don't oh uh, no uh, no we'll go faster if uh, if i carry him i love that bit of dialogue we'll go faster if i carry him because it's it's obvious that skeletal wants to hold him for the time being and from an animation point of view it's actually nice if you look at skeletal's rotoscoped walk they've actually put relay in there in a very smooth animation it's, it's a nice piece the dialogue coming up is just fantastic about the presents when Skeletor says when you open the presents they explode um, I just like the idea that that is fun for Skeletor fights and exploding presents oh we see the snow beast now and uh, if you go and look at the He-Man season 1 episode the dragon's gift you'll see that the snow beast is actually an ice hacker from back then although this is a very big overgrown Ethereum ice hacker known as the snow beast who Skeletor effortlessly disposes of. 
and coming up is quite possibly one of the most infamous scenes of the Christmas special. Be prepared. Hold it hold it together, people, hold it together. Don't weep. Do not weep for the loss of Skeletor's evil. Because Skeletor smiles. Listen, I am not nice, I am not kind, and I am not wonderful. You tell him Skeletor. I like that when Shel Skeletor Shelator? <laughs> Why do I keep changing characters' names when Skeletor shakes his head and you hear like the sound of bone shaking? So here comes Horde Prime in his ship, which is a strange visual. I remember as a kid for a brief point or like for a moment, I thought the ship itself was Horde Prime because when you saw Horde Prime, you saw these like, he looked robotic. So I just thought the ship was him, but it's not. And here comes He-Man and she -Ra. Oh, this territory, if you look at these strange circular shapes, there was a piece of development artwork I managed to obtain from Tom Cito for a while and um, in this piece of development artwork from the He-Man series it showed this landscape of Eternia and on this landscape were these strange circular shapes is what you see so it's almost like the artists were looking for inspiration for this new location on Etheria and went back to this piece of concept artwork it's a really really lovely location it's such a shame it wasn't used it's, li it's literally one of the, the most notable looking visually interesting locations on Ethereum we never ever see it again or before I should say going back to that fight between Hordak and Skeletor it's unique in the fact that during the series the She-Ra series whenever Skeletor would show up and Hordak and he would duel it was very rare that Hordak would win if you go back and look at episodes like Horde Prime Takes a Holiday and My Friend My Enemy it was always Skeletor getting the upper hand pretty much every time it was very rare that Hordak actually came out on top during their confrontations so for Hordak to win in such an easy manner is quite surprising actually Horde Prime come on Shiro we must stop him robots get them and so He-Man and Shira begin their battle against the Horde Troopers, which pretty much means He-Man and Shira are going to win quite easily. There's one interesting robot here. You see Leap in a shot. Here he comes. Whee! Trying to rugby tackle Shira. It's Multibot, who looks a great deal different to the toy version. And I'll talk about that in another commentary another time. But yeah, whenever Shira fought robots, Shira, nine times out of ten, actually ten times out of ten, came out on top. Here, catch, brother. Thanks, sis. What's interesting about that scene is that He-Man and She-Ra refer to one another as brother and sister. And I mean, they do a few times throughout this special, a few times in season one and a great deal in season two. You think they're not supposed to be related to one another um, officially because surely everybody would put two and two together and think, wait a minute, Adora shows up at the same time as She-Ra. Adora's related to Adam. Surely she was related to He-Man. You know, it's like people on Eternia and Etheria can't be that silly. And here we go, Skeletor committing an act of good. And he's committed a few acts of good in the series, you know, helping He-Man rid the world of Evil Seed and rid the world of Shigoro in the episodes Evil Seed and to save Skeletor respectively. But this act is like, Skeletor, what are you doing? You've just attacked the Horde Emperor. Although, however, you could twist this and think, well, this is Skeletor once again defecting from the Horde, saying, look, nobody commands me, but somehow I think it's more to do with him feeling the spirit of Christmas. I regret saying this. While Horde Prime's down and battered, I should mention that uh, Horde Prime actually shows up a few times in She-Ra's second season. But not only is he given a different voice, he acts very differently as well. Um, voiced by Lou Scheimer still, and he continues to boss around Horde, but certain mannerisms and his voice pace are completely altered. It just doesn't feel like the same character. Maybe it's a different Horde Prime. So yeah, he and She-Ra kind of kind of defeat Horde Prime here with the help of Skeletor. There, that'll take care of Horde Prime for a while. And yeah, this final scene, or I should say uh, penultimate scene, I guess, is one of the most, this shot here, it's one of the most annoying things ever. Bear in mind, throughout the He-Man series and She-Ra series, Skeletor is this ever-present enemy. He was responsible for kidnapping Princess Adora, so He-Man didn't know he had a sister for like 19, 20 years of his life. And suddenly He-Man stood next to him. It's like, He-Man, you've been waiting to capture Skeletor. Get him in a wrist lock, get him in a headlock, knock him out even. I know that's quite violent. I apologise for such violent beliefs. But it's like, this is Skeletor. And you're stood there next to him laughing with Shira. Look, there, don't laugh with him, He-Man. Just grab him. Knock him out. Oh. So I'd love to know how that scene ended. Did Skeletor just go, yeah, I'm going to head off now? 
And here we have the fondly remembered and beautifully illustrated panning shot featuring a plethora of characters. We've got characters like the Widgets, Lizard Man, Zodak, Manny Faces, Drio, Yucca's Montauk, Seahawk, everybody's in it, and Santa Claus. Santa Claus in eternity. I told you Santor was real. Santor is here, and he presents to the kids flying bells. So given that they've just received flying bells, belts that actually levitate them, defy gravity and all that, I'd say the kids' visit to Eternia and everything they went through, or that may scar them for life, was incredibly well worth it. At least that's my take on it. So man Arms just presses a few buttons and he can watch Earth, apparently. The puppy. Oh, I forgot about Relay the puppy. Actually, the Mansion puppy isn't in it as much as I remember. I could have sworn... And Merry Christmas. Christmas, everyone, and thank you. Merry Christmas. Even though I've talked over it a great deal, I should mention that at times the music in this special is really good in the sense that it evokes Christmas really well. It's interesting as well, you know, we, we watch He-Man and She-Ra, and like this is one of the first times, I think the first time, we see Earth clothes and a normal house and normal people, you know. Look at that dude's belly. So yeah, at any point it appears that the Eternians can just turn on a monitor and watch events unfold on the planet Earth. I like the idea that um, Man at Arms is looking at the events on Earth and suddenly sees a toy store and suddenly tunes into an action figure of himself and the space-time continuum itself breaks down as Man at Arms realises he is nothing more than an action figure and an animated series and, oh, the world, Eternia, is not real. Okay, Father. So yeah, levitating children, that's how this special ends. Parents, terrified. So yeah, Santor, here he is, making his first appearance in the He-Man series. Santor, the most powerful Santa in the universe, and wait, is that... It, it's Prince Adam? Wait, Prince Adam is Santor and He-Man? Oh my goodness. Lovely piece of animation here with Orko. Fantastic. And thus brings an end to the He-Man and She-Ra Christmas special. The moral segment here, I've got to say, is just absolutely fantastic the way it's written. It's so appropriate and, and really does beautifully sum up Christmas. Like, in the fact that Adam says, not everyone celebrates Christmas, but the spirit of the Christmas season is within us. Oh, it's such a fantastic way of wording it. And caring. And presents. <laughs> I still love Orko's obsession with presents. I tend to talk negatively about the Christmas special. There are certain aspects I really don't like that I feel are very detrimental to the series. Skeletor's actions are incredibly questionable throughout the special, although he's given reason to change as it were. But the special does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to evoke a feeling of happiness whenever it's watched, although I could do without the song. The truth is, I do like it. I always, always watch it on Christmas Day. Oh goodness, I've just realised like Skeletor, the spirit of Christmas, and the Mansheen puppy has got the better of me. I've, I've turned soft. Curse you, Mansheens. Curse you, Mansheen puppy. So that's it for this commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. I do realise it was hard going at times. I apologise for that. Feel free to leave comments, and nice comments are encouraged. Remember to like and share the video, and be sure to check out all the other videos on this channel. And finally, if you have yet to do so, subscribe.